I'm joined now by TSN Football Insider Dave Naylor. Dave, thanks for taking some time to talk some Canadian football with me today. My pleasure. Very much so. So Argos fans are buzzing about this week's episode of CFL 2020. Uh, they previewed the Argos, of course, as you know, and Milt Stiegel and Davis Sanchez were on the McLeod Bethel Thompson train and uh, Dunnigan and Burris say, no way, it's got to be Matt Nichols. I got to know, where do you stand? Who's right? Who's wrong? What do you think? I got to say, I'm, I'm in the Matt Nichols camp on this one. I, and I think you just look at it and say, what has a guy accomplished in his Canadian Football League career? I mean, it's funny that and, and a little bit kind of like a sad is more the word for Matt Nichols is that if you look at his era as a Winnipeg Blue Bomber quarterback, and it's not that long, like we're talking like four seasons, it's among the most productive, successful eras in Bomber history. And, and you know, that's why I thought they would go back to him even after the Grey Cup win, because I mean, you know, Zach Caleros is, you know, four games removed from a lot of people in the league, not thinking he was a good risk. And he played four games in, remarkable circumstances and it's it's a historical uh performance that we'll look back on uh, but is it indicative of the future for him that that's the debate and look Matt Nichols has had kind of the same issue that's been around Zach a little bit and that is that he gets injured a lot now his injuries have not been the kind that you know are related to head injuries and put you out for a season I was at bomber training camp uh two years ago when, you know, he took five steps and boom, down he went and he, and he missed, you know, the next four weeks. And we've seen, and I think he's played nicked up and banged up. You, you always heard whispers around him that he's, you know, his shoulder or his elbow or his knee or something wasn't right. So I think that's part of what, but overall, I mean, you could look at it and say, you know, he had a great offensive coordinator in Paul Apolise. They had a great offensive line. He's got a, you know, historically great running back there. And that all takes pressure off him to win games. But I, I still think that, when you look at his overall stats and look at the way he was performing when he went out last season. I mean, he was, you know, playing as well. Matt Nichols' success tends to revolve around his ability to secure the football. When he's not throwing interceptions, he can win you games. When he throws interceptions, he can't. And, you know, there was that little blip in the 2018 season when he went about a month and, you know, fired a whole bunch of interceptions and, and you know, the Bombers lost a bunch of games. And I don't know that I've ever known a quarterback who takes the ability to secure the football as personally as Matt Nichols does. Like when he turns it over, it, it like it crushes him, you know, and then and it's, it's important for every quarterback. You know, the stats are there about turnovers, interceptions, wins and losses. But for Matt Nichols, it's, I honestly think it's, it's, it's more top of mind for him than almost any quarterback I've ever been around. So uh, I, I think, I think he should be the guy. Now McLeod Bethel Thompson is an interesting case because he's an older guy for, you know, somebody who's still relatively inexperienced in the CFL. He's a lifer, right? He's a guy who, by his own admission, wants to play football and grind it out, you know, in any way he can. Uh, and, and I think there was a, a lack of patience for him, you know, with the Argonauts the last few years just because we forget sometimes that when a guy comes in at 22 or 23, we understand he's going to take some time to learn the game. Well, when a guy comes in at, you know, 29 or 30, it's still going to take him time to learn the game. Uh, the, the, his age doesn't really make that much difference when it comes to adapting to the CFL game. So, so I, and, and again, he's one of the things he hasn't had trouble with is staying healthy. So I like the one, two combination of Matt Nichols based on his record, based on his performance last year, he's been a winner with the understanding that if we were talking about an 18 game season, he probably isn't going to get through all t- eight. His history would tell you that may be an issue, or even you may want to sit him for a couple of weeks just to allow him to get healthy if he's nicked up, even if he could go. And you've got a great one A option in McLeod Bethel Thompson, who, look, I, I, I think his performance, his comeback against Winnipeg last year in that second half of that Argo win, the 0 and 5 Argos beating the 5 and 0 Bombers, I, I think that may have saved his career. And you know, from that point on. That he was a very competent CFL quarterback on a not very good team, especially against Ottawa. They he looked he looked excellent against Ottawa. Yeah, but, if you uh, put those stats over eighteen games, he's going to the Hall of Fame off one yeah, season. Sure, exactly. So, what what did you think of the uh, the all time Argos list that that was put out? Because uh, I, I I you know I think it's such a difficult thing to do. You're talking about a team with a, yeah. you know 150 years of history, but were there any any um, any selections or omissions that kind of made you raise a spocky and eyebrow? You know, it wasn't so much individual omissions. It was more kind of the nature of this team of, of how many players were on the list um, that 
that maybe didn't spend that much time with the Toronto Argonauts. You know, like one of the things about this team is, and when you evaluate an all-time team, you can, you know, is somebody like Doug Flutie who played two years for the Argonauts, but was, you know, historically great in those two years, you know, worth more than somebody who played a whole bunch of years. And that's one of the things with the Argos, which is weird because, you know, you have a team like, you have some organizations that have been good a lot of years, but they never win the Great Cup. And, and, but they're never terrible. And the Argonauts have been really good and really bad. Really good and really bad. And the problem when you go from being really good to being really bad is you turn your roster over, right? That's we, this is what we're, we're probably going to get into a little bit talking about where the Argos are right now. And so you have players that are on that roster that um, were, uh, were, were not Argos necessarily for great lengths of time because they kind of got – you know, caught in the swoon of the turnover or in Flutie's case, going to the National Football League. I mean, I guess one of the things that jumped out of me was, you know, the, the quarterback position. There are so many Argo quarterbacks who've been great, but how many of them have been, the, like, there's a reason Ricky Ray is the all-time leading quarterback in the Toronto Argonauts, which is stunning because, you know, most of us still think of him as primarily an Edmonton Eskimo. But that just tells you how much that position has turned over. So whether you wanted to put Matt Dunnigan on that list or well, we wouldn't have put Tracy Ham because he wasn't very good as an Argo, you know, or, or others, it, it's, there's just been so much turnover. A lot of players, the two teams that really kind of jumped out at me that were rep, well represented were the 91 Argos, you know, where you have Pinball Clemens, Daryl K. Smith, Rodney Harding, Reggie Pleasant, you know, and, that, and then that group kind of, um, of the, the late 90s, right, where you had, you know, Steinauer and O'Shea and Mookie Mitchell. And that's kind of really what jumped – and, of course, Mike Clemens on the 91 team as well. So w- when I think of the Argonauts the last 30 years, I think of, you know, even though they've won some great cups, you know, 04, 2012, 2017, I wouldn't put any of those teams in kind of great team categories. The only two I would are the 91 team and the 96-97 group. Uh, and and, and I thought it was, it was appropriate that, that those groups were, were well represented. I mean, there's so many players you can think of that have been good for the Argonauts uh, in shorter periods of time. And I think every time I think of one, you know, whether it's a Robert Drummond at running back or Chris Gaines at linebacker or guys like that, who were very good players. They also have very short tenures. I mean, the Argos, and I think this is probably you know, part of the, of the, the challenge marketing the team over the last 30 years is there's been so much turnover on their roster. And, and I say that relative to other CFL teams, you know, not, I don't, I think, it, I think it's when you look at the consistency on other teams, but um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty good roster. I got to say, you know, and, and when I look at guys, I mean, going back to the 91 team, you know, when you look at guys like Don Moen, Chris Schultz, Dan Farone. I mean, those teams are, are very well represented. Um, and you could almost do an all-time Argo team, just taking the 96, 97 team and the 91 team. And I'm, you know, I'm 52, so I can't, you know, I remember Jim Corrigal, but when you start to get into Stillwagon and Shadow and those guys, you know, I'm limited like everybody else in, in terms of, uh, you know, trying to, trying to pick out guys that, that, you know, I thought Jim, it was, you know, Rocket Ismail would have been an interesting one. Um, had one really kind of dynamic year for the Argonauts. Uh, you know, 90, in 92, he was not at all the same player, but they didn't have at all the same team. Uh, you know, he was an exciting guy. Uh, but, but again, we put him next to Chad Owens, you know, who won an MOP. Um, you know, I, look, if, look, if I was choosing Rocket Ismail in his prime or Chad Owens in his prime, you know, I, I might take Rocket Ismail, but I can't argue with the performance that Chad Owens as a Toronto Argonaut was a more impactful player than Rocket Ismail was. Yeah, they were both so electric. Yeah. You, you talked about the the roster turnover over the years. I don't think I don't think we've ever seen anything like this year. Right now, we've got sixty eight Toronto Argonauts without a jersey number assigned to them. Have you ever seen anything like this from a non expansion team before? I, I never have. I, I, I mean, and and look, it's you know, I, I think it's a lot of time what organizations need to do when you come in. You know, like for instance, I was critical of, of Montreal you know, under Cavis Reed, that they didn't do this, you know, early on, that they tried to patch it together. And I assume some of that came from pressure from ownership that they hadn't been in the playoffs. They want to see them in the playoffs uh, as opposed to say what Chris Jones did in Saskatchewan, you know, when he went in and essentially did this right. And said, Hey, we're going to be young. We're going to be exciting. Uh, we're may, we may not win right away, but you know, we're going to build something here. And they really did. Um, you know, maybe not a coincidence that John Murphy 
was central to that rebuilding in Saskatchewan under Chris Jones. And he's the one engineering a lot of what's going on in Toronto right now. And, and he, he one upped himself, though. Like, this is, this is yeah, like. No, he absolutely did. Um, but, I, you know, like, and I, I'm always sort of hesitant about teams that try to build themselves through free agency. But I thought the Argos did a really good job in free agency this year. I mean, their Canadian receiver position, which has been woeful, you know, really for the last number of years. I mean, there, there are lots of good Canadian receivers. And they just had not been very good at, at getting those kind of players. Um, and yet you look at the way they've built up that position, uh, linebacker, others. It's, you know, it's basically, I think a lot of this is John Murphy betting on himself. You know, like John's one of these guys who, you know, he grinds it out 24 hours a day. Like I, I, if you call John Murphy at 3.30 in the morning, he's probably texting with an agent or a player. I mean, he's that kind of guy, right? He, so I think he relishes the opportunity to just kind of, you know, go with a, a completely blank palette and start – and start over. I think that was, and, and given the way the Argonauts have played the last few years, you know, you can, you can certainly see, you know, the reason for doing that. And, you know, even some of their best players were guys that either were long in the tooth, like an SA, SJ Green, or were making tons of money, like a Darrell Walker. So, you know, even that part of it, uh, but I know I've, I've never seen anything quite uh, this dramatic. And, and yet I think they have a chance to be, you know, a decent team. You talk about the the receiver rebuild, this receiving core. There's one guy missing on that list, and I know you looked into this a lot. Is the TJ Jones dream dead in Toronto? What do you make of that? I, I think there are some issues that uh, have fallen by the wayside because of the preoccupation with trying to get the season going. You know, with the with the pandemic, and it's funny because I remember I was reporting on the TJ Jones issue when I was at the NFL Combine in Indianapolis which was February 24th to 27th. Now, think how much the world changed in two weeks after that. I mean, I was, you know, standing in Joe Burrow's scrum you know, with, with 150 other reporters. I was going out to bars at night, wasn't even thinking about it. Uh, of course, a lot changed within two weeks. And, and in that, the T.J. Jones story did. Like, I, I believe there was some conversation between the Players Association and the league about – I'm trying to remember how this was. It, the concern was that in paying TJ Jones $200,000, they were taking money, money away from other Canadian. It, it took a disproportionate amount of money in away from other Canadian players because he had this status that he didn't have to be subject to the rookie cap. Now, I don't agree with that. Like I, I'm a, I'm a more of a, of a free market guy when it comes to sports. I actually like socialism in society. I don't like it in sports. <laughs> and so, so I don't, I don't agree with this. Um, I, I don't understand why saying, Hey, if he makes 200,000, that takes money away from other Canadians in that locker room. Uh, how about Mike Riley making 700 grand? What does that do to the guys in the BC lions locker room? And where's the players association on that one? Well, they're nowhere and they shouldn't be there. Like, I, I don't think that make the, the point is, I think sometimes I'm going to say this, try to do this with respect. Sometimes this league, is run more in the interest of the owners or the players, not the fans. And I think this is an issue right here where the players and the owners are arguing over this TJ Jones thing. Come on. The Canadian Football League is better with TJ Jones than it is without. He's Canadian. He fits the rules. You're, if, if you're going to say that you're going to limit the salary of a five-year NFL vet, to, that he's not going to be able to come to the CFL with a free market, um, then you're not going to have any as – I, as I wrote when I was in Indianapolis, if you enforce this rule the way it's written, you, you're basically saying the best Canadian football players on the planet will never foot, step foot in the CFL because they're not going from the National Football League to making 65,000 Canadian. It, it's nonsensical. So even trying to limit that – and I'm trying to remember the details of what the Players Association proposal was on this, but it was, it was some way to kind of mitigate – the amount of money that he was taking up. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, you know, so much has happened between now and the time that that was in detail, and I wish I had the details of it. But it was basically, I guess what I could say is, it was manipulating the market, artificially limiting the market, right? And, and, I, and I, just, I just don't think that's in the fans' interest. Because what people got to understand is that if T.J. Jones isn't playing in the CFL, the guy who replaces him on the roster is off the street, right? <laughs> that's, that's who you're signing. So is, is this league better with a five-year NFL vet, you know, who's a, who's a legit player, 
or the or a guy who right now is on the street. I I, I just can't wrap my head around it. Uh, I I thought that the you know the league's rule changes in recent years to allow guys that are Canadians, even if they didn't grow up in Canada, if you got Canadian citizenship, if your parents do, look, I, I think that was an improvement because it improved the level of talent in the league. Uh, nobody thinks the league is is worse because Alex Singleton, you know, starred at middle linebacker for three years. And is there a guy in this league who represented our league better, who had more involvement and position and contribution to his community in Calgary than Alex Singleton did? I don't think there is. So, you know, it, it didn't exactly hurt the league that he was given Canadian status, right? And I know he came through the draft, which is different. The TJ Jones thing is such a unique thing because he wasn't taken in the draft because the rule was different then, right? So it's not like we're going to have a, necessarily a ton of these guys because most of these guys are going to be, uh, are going to be property of, of a team. But you, we, we are going to need to do something about the rule that says they can't make more than 65000 And it's, it's a rule that I think benefits some players. I don't think it benefits fans. And I, and I really think this league is at a point in time in its, in its existence where – the fans' interests have to come before the players. The fans' interests have to come before the owners, and this is a clear example of me. I, the point is, I don't think it's going to get resolved uh, in time for anything this season. Um, I, I could be wrong about that. It's just one that's kind of slipped off the radar for a while. But I have an opinion on it, as you can tell. <laughs> yes, <laughs> which is not a shock, but uh, you know, awesome. So. We talked a little bit about, you know, uh, fans getting behind the team, the league and what's best yeah. for the fans in the city of Toronto. There have maybe been two or three occasions in my lifetime where I felt like the city was legitimately behind the team. You know, once in in the early 80s and and then again with with, um, you know, Rocket Ishmael and that right. and that ownership group yeah. and, and maybe maybe with the, the Doug Flutie era, too. And, and briefly in 2012, because you had the 100th Grey Cup, yeah. the Argos were there, and the NHL conveniently shut down. Which right, you know, that worked out. Work. Yeah. Um, but, you know, what, what do the Argos do? Like, well, if, if you're MLSE, what do you do to try and make this team Toronto's team, like truly Toronto's team? Uh, as you could probably guess, I have spent a lot of hours, some of them in the middle of the night, <laughs> some of them while I'm driving my car, some of them in the showers, some of them probably while I'm talking to other people, thinking about the, this question. Because I mean, the Toronto Argonauts really are unique in this way. I mean, they have a 150-year-old you know, brand. Um, the number of people I meet, you know, who are maybe in their 60s or 70s and know what I do for a living, and they're Southern Ontario people, and they tell me that they had Argo seasons tickets and they went to every game. And then they'll turn to me and say, why don't people care like they used to? And I will say, how many kids do you have? And they will say, I have three. And I'll say, do your kids follow the Argonauts? And they will say, no. And I will say, that's why. Because somehow you didn't pass it on to them, right? And that's, it really is a generational thing that happened around the mid-1980s, you know, right after the Argonauts won that 1983 Great Cup. The Blue Jays get into their first pennant race in 94. They're playing, or in 84, excuse me, they're up against New York, Boston, Detroit, you know, and all of a sudden it was like Toronto outgrew the Canadian Football League. Um, the answer to the question is, is very, very difficult because lots and lots of things have been tried. Um, and and I, I, if there's anything I'm most disappointed about, I guess it's that the move to BMO did not create a resurgence. Um, I would have done things differently moving there. I would have gone to all extremes to try to fill that stadium. I mean, when they had 12,000 people there for their second date there, that was a killer. I, I don't care if you've got to like go dig up corpses in the cemetery and stick them in the stands. Like there can't be 12,000 people in that stadium for the second game at BMO. That cannot happen because that to me was like the BMO dream died that night, a Tuesday night game against Ottawa. 12,000 people in the stands. Can't happen. Um, and, and, I, and I know they don't want to get into giveaways and things like that, but I would have spent a year with MLSE's resort. At that time, it wasn't MLSE. It was Bell and, and, and uh, Larry Tannenbaum. But still, no shortage of resources. I would have spent a year filling that stadium and making it a place to be rather than saying we're not going to give away tickets and having 12,000 people there on the second night of the seat. You know, it hasn't helped that in – whatever it's been now, four years that they've been at BMO, you know, three of the years they've sucked. And, and I'm, when I say sucked, I mean not just that they've lost more games than they've won, 
it's been unentertaining football. And I say that as an Argonaut season ticket holder who pays for my seats. I do not get comp seats. I pay like everybody else. So I'm, I'm evaluating the value of the entertainment experience on the same basis everyone else is. Um, but what I would do, I would, I mean, I do a lot of things they're trying to do. I, I would try to raise the game day awareness. That's one thing. I would love to stand at Young and Bluer on an Argonaut game day and ask people if they know when the next time the Argonauts play is. I think it would be stunning at the number you'd get. And as somebody very smart said to me once, if people know we're playing, I can't guarantee they will come to our game. But if they don't know we're playing, I can guarantee you they're not coming. And I, and I honestly think the awareness of when the Toronto Argonauts play at home is so low that you're limiting yourself to a small portion of the population that even know they're playing. So that would be the first thing I would do. I would do a lot to raise the awareness that a game is happening because people cannot attend a game that they do not know is happening. And, and that's, that's to me the biggest problem. And I say, I'd love to try that experiment sometime. Maybe I'll do it. Maybe I'll stand there with a clipboard at Young and Bluer at noon on an Argo game day and just say, do you know when the Toronto Argonauts next play? It would be stunningly low, right? So that, that would be my first thing. You know, I think the idea of getting young people into the stadiums, you know, in, in encouraging families to bring kids and making that like a discount point, which they've done. Um, you know, I, I like some of the things they've done to the game day experience, um, but, it, but it's hard, right? It's, it's, it's like, unfortunately, trying to sell me on soccer. doesn't matter what you do. I'm just not interested. I, I, and that's just where I grew up. You know, soccer is not a big thing in my upbringing. I don't understand the game. So many of the rules don't make sense to me. And every time I, I give myself to it, there's a zero zero game or something. And I say, why would I do this? again? Like there's, there's lots of people like that on Canadian football and it doesn't matter how you, so in, in a way you got to kind of get people at the, at the young experience. Um, I, I would try to take advantage of what great ambassadors these players are for the game, their willingness. And I know they've done this, some of these things to go into schools, to be community with groups. I mean, the players in this league are incredible. I mean, I've covered, you know, the NFL, hockey, Major League Baseball, the NBA, I've covered them all. Uh, and the players in this league will do things because they understand that that's part of the role that they have to help the league, continue, you know, to, to thrive. Uh, I, I take advantage of that as, as much as you can. But the biggest thing to me would just be that they're not doing, because I can give you all kinds of things they're already doing, you know, discount on beers and hot dogs and, and all those kinds of things. But I would say just incentives for parents to bring kids to games and raise awareness of when they play. That would be, that would be my two big things. I, I would, I can give you the results of that young bluer survey right now. Uh, I, I think, I think it's going to be so low, but, but yeah, you're does right. It make like, sense that, that you're, 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 if one percent of the population knows there's a game, then you're marketing to one percent of the population, not 99, you know, 99 percent of people are ruled out. They, they, logically cannot come to your game because they don't know what's happened. And what's even scarier, I think, is even football people, like uh, teams that I've coached, whether it's high school or semi-pro, like I will talk about, you know, excited about the Argos game this weekend. And, and most of them have no idea that there's a game. And those are guys that are playing football, some of whom, you know, have even been in the CFL or trying to get into the CFL. And they don't even know when the schedule, you know, when the schedule is, is and when the Argos right. are playing. And, and that's, there is a real disconnect, not just between young people in general in the Canadian Football League in Southern Ontario, but between young football players in general. And that, that is mind boggling when you think of it, right? And, and I could name you, but I don't want to embarrass these guys, okay? I could name you some very prominent CFL Canadian players who have been held up as the model of what we want Canadian football players to be. They're, they've been all-stars. Uh, they've been great cup champions. Uh, they've been big personalities in the league. They've embraced the league. And yet, if you pull them aside privately and ask them if they ever watched the CFL when they were growing up, they will tell you no. In fact, I know a guy who's a very good player, played in the National Football League, played in the CFL, Canadian, grew up in Toronto. He told me this, the first CFL game he ever watched, he played it. Wow. Think of that. Wow. That's and, and I mean, this is a guy who played in the NFL and grew up right. in Toronto. And, 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 you know, he eventually, like everybody who gets exposed to it, became 
almost an evangelist for the greatness of Canadian football. <laughs> right. But not while he was growing up. That's so frustrating. Um, moving along to, you know, sort of where we are now as we sort of, um, you know, look at the, the state of Canadian football at the moment. You had a great line um, it was about a month ago when you said, you know, right now it's third and long for the CFL. Yeah. What is it now? <laughs> uh, it's almost like we're in a timeout with 20 seconds left on the clock. And back to back delay of game penalties. We're well, back to back delay of game penalties backing us up to our own 30 yard line. And we're going to bring Michael Bishop in off the bench to throw oh, a God. 70 yard ball. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I love it when I can make a Michael Bishop reference. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, that, that's where we are. I mean, to, to lay it out as, as simply as I can, as I can, um, I think the league and the Players Association have settled or solved most of their issues that they had. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be to everybody's satisfaction, but I think they've negotiated pretty much as far as they can. And there's going to be, you know, a kind of take it or leave it offer on the table for the players at this point. Um, the you know, there's some issues that may still need to be resolved. Like a big one is guarantees. Like are players going to leave jobs to come to the hub in Winnipeg? And then if this all blows up in a COVID explosion in two weeks, like what are you sending them home with? And I think that's a legitimate question for the players to want some assurances on. Um, the, uh, the government thing has been, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious the government doesn't want to deal with this. They've had this on their front burner or had it placed on their, they put it on the back burner, but the CFLs tried to put it on their front burner for months. Uh, they kicked it down the road to the Business Development Bank of Canada, which is a crown corporation that you know, deals with high-risk loans. They gave the league a loan that the league didn't find palatable. They basically tried to put it back on the government's front doorstep and say, look, you don't owe us a yes, but you owe us an answer. And I, those are my words, not theirs, but that's my interpretation of the situation, right? Just tell us yes or no. But right now we've never got a yes or no from you. We've got these kind of maybes and the business development bank. So, you know, if they can get what is a $30 million loan, um, then, you know, there's a, then there's a chance they can go forward. And I, and I think the, the curious thing to me is going to be how much will is there among both the players and the teams to go forward if they get that one? Like, I don't think it's a slam dunk that you can book kickoff. I think there's a lot of things that have to happen in terms of logistics. Uh, and I mean, I get teams text to me all the time. How are we going to do this? What are we going to do about that? Like, there's all kinds of questions that have to be answered if they go forward, forward playing. And, I, and I've been party to some of these conversations with teams that have real questions about how this is all going to be put together in you know, a matter of a few short weeks. Um, and, and I, and I think there's a lot of players that aren't going to play, you know, I, I think it's, I think that number's probably grown as time's gone on because guys have moved on and got jobs or they've mentally just kind of moved on. You know how sometimes when you've just kind of accepted that something's not going to happen and then says, Oh yeah, it is. Well, you know what? You've moved on. I mean, I talked to a player last week, you know, fairly prominent player, uh, who said to me, look, my, uh, my body is worth more than a third of a CFL salary and, and you know, the risk of COVID. I, I, it's just not what I'm willing to put my body through for. Um, I've talked to other players who, who want to play, say, hey, I'm 25, I'm single, I don't have a family, I got nothing else to do, I just want to play ball, right? So there's, there's going to be a range there. Uh, and I think there's some, may, there may be some variance of will among the teams. You know, I'm, I'm not sure all nine teams want to play as badly equally. You know what I mean? I think there are some that are, that are really want to play. I think there's some that are very hesitant to play. So they got to sort that out. So the government getting a yes on the $30 million loan, I don't think, you know, you just go right from there to kick off. I think there's a lot of things that have to be worked through, but I don't, you know, I think the reason we're in this double overtime is that when you've waited four months for an answer from the government and you think you might get one in 48 hours or 72 hours, it's tough to tell yourself, well, let's move on. You know, and that's kind of where we are. Is, is, do you think any of this relates to liability at all? Like you look at the NCAA and, and what's going on there. And I think liability is a, a big issue that they've got. Is that something that the CFL is concerned about? Or is that not, not what they're talking about at all? I don't think as much because the difference between the CFL or other professional leagues and the NCAA is you have a players union that represents the group, right? So you can, you can negotiate on the issue of liability, right? That the league can say, hey, if a player gets positive for COVID, we will be responsible for his medical care for the next 24 months or whatever you do. You can, you can come up with an agreement that the union then says to the players, this is how 
the league. We've, we've released the league from long-term liability on COVID, but they've agreed to cover COVID related illnesses. Like, you know what I mean? So you've got an agreement, you've got legal protection of the league. The problem in college football is there's no union. So, so how do you, how do you negotiate, you know, a mitigation of liability with thousands of players? Right? And, and that's, it's interesting because it's an issue that's come up in college football for a long, long time. Uh, that they don't have any representation. And it's really come to a head with this COVID stuff. I, I, you know, I think it is an issue, but I think it's an issue that's manageable or solvable if both sides have the will to do it, as opposed to what you've got in college football, where I don't know how you would begin to create liability protection, you know, from thousands of players that aren't represented by any, any uh, union. So final question, do you think there is any chance right now that we see a single snap of three down football in 2020 if you were a betting man uh, you know how much how much risk are you, you putting out there on there being a single snap well i to be clear i've been pessimistic all along you know like i had a i was on a radio show about six weeks ago and the guy welcomed me and said are you still optimistic there'll be a season i said sorry i've never been optimistic there's be a season. like other than in february you know i have not been uh, and i'm still not you know, I, I just think the, the, the number of challenges. Now, all that said, I don't believe the league would have extended itself into this week if it didn't think it had a legitimate shot of getting government money. I think they would have folded their tent last week unless they were given some indication that this is at least possible. So I've been as low as, you know, one or 2% that they would play. Uh, you know, I might be in the kind of 10 to 15% range now. I, I don't think it's impossible. I wouldn't count on it. Uh, I just think there's a lot of un unknowns, a lot of logistics that have to be climbed over, even if you do get, and really, they need two things from the government, not just one. They need them to sign off on their sort of mitigation of the border uh, rule to allow players to have sort of a, a quarantine that would be, uh, to some degree, an exception to what other people coming across the border have, similar to what hockey, you know, has got. Uh, and you also need... Um, you also need uh, the, the government approval, and then you got to pull off all the logistics. I'll go with 10%. How's that? It's, it's pretty low, but that's pretty much what I'm thinking right now, too. So uh, I'm still, still hoping, fingers crossed, but at the same time, I don't even, I don't know. I, I don't know what I actually, you know, what, what my heart wants versus what, you know, I, I, the decision that I think I would make. Uh, I don't, I don't think they're the same thing. So, well, I, I, one thing I would say is that I have never, there've been a lot of people who've tied the future or the existence of the league to playing this year. Oh, if they don't play this year, the league's dead. I've never done that. In fact, I don't, I, that doesn't make any sense to me on any level, economic, otherwise, right? Be like, Oh, the league's going to be, they don't play out of sight, out of mind. Really? What, what would we say about the national hockey league when they didn't play in 04, 05, when they came back, was that, out of sight, out of mind, or was that absence made the heart grow fonder? I think it was absence made the heart grow fonder. So I, I've never bought into this idea that, you know, must play at all costs. No. And in fact, I've been of the, the opinion that if they play or attempt to play and it goes off the rails, I think that does more damage to the league than not playing. So look, if they can play, great. If they can play safely, great. If they can play to everybody's satisfaction, sure, that's better than not playing. But I've never believed that this future of the Canadian Football League rides on having a six-game season, uh, you know, in playoffs this year. That, that just, that has never made sense to me economically, logically, anything. So, so I, I'm hopeful, but I'm not sitting here going to be crushed that, you know, the league is in, look, you know, here's the reality. The league is going to be in real challenging times with or without playing. And the thing that's going to determine the future of the league more than anything is not whether they play this year, it's whether you can put 15 to 20,000 people in a stadium next year. That's the issue. Great answer. And Dave, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. It's been awesome. You've been really generous with your time. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, talking some football with us today. My pleasure. Always love to do it. And it's actually fun to actually talk real football. I know we got to have the COVID conversation, but it was great to just dig into McLeod Bethel Thompson versus Manic. I haven't talked about those things in months. It's fun.